Uh, hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Fred Murphy. I work with the Marxist Education Project. Uh, we're just going to make a, a couple of announcements before we get started. I uh, wanted to let you know the MEP is about to begin a new winter term in January. We'll have uh, uh, about uh, five uh, new class series and two or three that are continuing. Uh, I wanted to highlight a reading group on the works of Mike Davis, whose recent death was a really an irreplaceable loss for the left in the U.S. and internationally. Uh, the details of all of this will be available soon on our website, uh, which you're mostly familiar with, marksedproject.org. I'll put that in the chat as well. And I'd like to also call your attention to the fact that we have a long-awaited resumption of classes on Marx's Capital Volume 1. Uh, that will be coordinated by Lisa Mayenauer. Uh I was hoping Lisa might drop in and say a few words about that, but uh, I don't see her. So uh, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Clara Mate, who is Assistant Professor at, of Economics at the New School for Social Research. And in 2018-19, she was a member of the School of Social Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. She's here today to tell us about her book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invented Austerity and Paved the Way to Fascism. Uh, and following her presentation, we'll have time for a conversation, questions, comments from you all. Uh, so without further uh, ado, uh, let me turn it over to Clara. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, it's not easy to present one's own work, especially work that uh, has taken me almost 10 years to um, accomplish. So uh, what I will try to do is to get you uh, involved in the topic and supposedly curious to then uh, potentially uh, read uh, the the, the book itself, given that it is uh, ambitious in the amount of themes that it tries to cover. So um, let me start by, by sorry, I just put back the gallery view, which is better, so I see you all. Uh, okay, so let me start by giving a sense of where this book situa situates itself. The Capital Order is a book in historical political economy. The idea is to um, rethink the debate concerning austerity. Austerity is again shaping our lives. It has come back with a vengeance. It's everywhere in the globe but once more. Um, this we can see uh, through the interest rate hikes that we know are happening uh, for at least, it's been happening for at least almost six months now um, in all central banks. And then uh, we see it in the new budgets, uh, Britain, Italy, but also the United States have clearly told us that the time for great spending is over and we need to cut back, especially in the social sector. We know that the Republicans, for example, are already envisaging a cut in Medicare and other social benefits. So um, austerity is back and the... The idea of the book is that austerity has never left us. Uh, austerity has actually has been shaping our lives for almost a century. And the claim is that austerity is actually in the DNA of capitalism. So rather than focus on neoliberalism and austerity as just a feature of that specific period starting from the late 70s onwards, the idea here is that it's much more relevant to speak about austerity capitalism rather than neoliberalism, because neoliberalism gives a sense that um, it's the exception to a possible norm in which capitalism is something of uh, somewhat potentially socially minded or in some form possibly reformable in a humane way that is not austere. Um, instead, the claim of the book is that austerity is fundamental to the functioning of capitalism. And indeed, it serves a crucial function, which is that of protecting capital. And when I say that's the title of the book is The Capital Order. And here what we mean by capital, and of course, I don't need to tell you guys, um, given that you're all students of Karl Marx, the idea is that capital is as a commodity, as wealth, money invested to make more money, um, presupposes 
a specific social relation of production, right? Which is the fact that society is organized in a way by which we are all um, forced to sell our labor power in return for a wage, which is a low one and in precarious conditions. Now, the idea here is that capital as this fundamental social relation of our system, of course, is not a natural given. Uh, that's the whole point, right, of critical political economy. And it requires protection. It requires protection. It requires constant safeguarding. And this is exactly the purpose austerity plays. The purpose of austerity is to function as a bulwark in defense of capitalism and its fundamental social relation. So this seems obvious, but it really isn't that much. Uh, if you guys have um, followed a little bit about the debate on austerity, especially after the 2008 crisis, what you see is that we have, of course, the proponents of austerity, which are kind of the protagonists of my book. Um, and then you have the critics, but the critics are mostly Mar uh, Keynesians. And their idea is that austerity is just bad economic theory, which thus uh, brings about bad economic policy, right? So kind of a, a, a theoretical mistake. Now, the problem with this um, way of spinning the debate is that it depoliticizes austerity. It understands austerity merely as basically a tool to manage the economy, which can be right or wrong. Um, and it fundamentally depends on what moment of the cycle you're in, but fundamentally we can just understand it in technical terms and in the aggregate, right? The idea instead here is to say Keynesians are kind of missing the point because if you ask them why is austerity so persistent throughout the 20th and 21st century, their response can only be, well, it's madness, right? If you guys uh, read uh, like the work of Mark Blythe, uh, the famous work on austerity, that is kind of his take is that austerity is madness. Why is it madness? Well, because it has come, come about, governments have implemented it over and over again, but it has never really achieved its purported goals of balancing the budget and increasing economic growth, yet it's constantly re-employed. So the idea here is that the study, the capital order, is capable of giving us a much more satisfactory answer of why austerity persists. It persists because it is a fundamentally political project to discipline the population into accepting capitalism as the only alternative possible as the only game in town. There is no alternative but capitalism. This is the purpose austerity serves. And of course, there are potentially short-term costs. For example, the recession that is being induced currently by the interest rate hikes. But the short-term cost has a much more structural gain, which is that of stabilizing the class relations that are fundamental to our society. So austerity may not be successful in stabilizing economies, but in the very destabilization of economies, it serves as a much more fundamental goal for the survival of capitalism in the long run and the perpetuation of capital accumulation. This is kind of the thesis. And how do I get to this intuition? I get to it by looking at the origins of austerity. So the book is a historical book, and it's a work in historical political economy with the intuition that if we see the function austerity played after the First World War, after the First World War, so exactly 100 years ago, we can really clearly understand the logic of austerity up to this moment and why it has never really left us. So maybe I can now bring you back a little into the setting that the book reconstructs. Uh, the book is divided in two main parts. And I think both of them um, can stand, especially the first part can also stand on its own feet. And I wrote it to actually inspire uh, it's a book that discusses austerity, but it has a very positive message of the possibility of constructing alternatives that austerity is not the, uh, the necessary way forward. So the first part of the book 
is fundamentally a study of the existential crisis of capitalism. After the First World War, so 1918, 1920, those two years were the revolutionary years in which the system was considered by all to be breaking down. So if you look at the newspaper of the epoch, if you look at all the archival work I've done, it is clear that the, for the majority, from the bourgeoisie to the working classes, the system was not going to survive for more than a couple of years. Of course, we're talking about a moment in which we, in, in Russia and in Eastern Europe, we had, of course, the, the Great Revolution. The book focuses on two countries that are at the core of the capitalist West, Great Britain and Italy. And what I show is that even in Western Europe, citizens were convinced that the First World War had brought, in, had brought a, a complete break from the status quo prior to the war, that there was no reverting back to market-led capitalism. So I give, a, there's many, many citations, um, but just to give a sense, this is Palmiro Togliatti, um, who was leader of Olordine Nuovo uh, with Gramsci. He says, men recoil from the old order of things. They feel the need to place themselves in a new manner, to shape their community in a new form of of forging new living relations that allow for a construction of a wholly renewed social edifice. And these words, you know, of a radical Marxist uh, militant were echoed very similarly by the voices of the um, elite leading uh, state institutions. So, for example, we can read the words of David Lloyd George, who was heading the British government after the First World War. And he clearly says, hopefully I find it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, this one I could have put down, but give me a second, I'll find it. Get one more second, otherwise I move on and I, and we find it later. Here he is. So he spoke at, in, to the crowds in 1918. He says, what is our task? To make Britain a fit country for heroes to live in. We will lift those who have been living in the dark places to a plateau where they will get the rays of the sun. And this is not exactly the quote I was looking for. Another quote he's definitely saying, there's no way we can revert back to the old order fundamentally. That is the main message of the multiple quotes that the book takes on. And the idea here is that the story of the capital order starts with the Great War. And it shows how the state, in order to win the war, needed to exert an unprecedented and unimaginable economic role. So fundamentally, the sanctity of the market, and especially the pillars of capitalism, which are labor relations, wage relations, and private property of the means of production were fundamentally repoliticized. So the first chapter gets into the role of the state in guiding for the first time the economy, right? War collectivism, the, com co the nationalization of the main industries that went hand in hand with the complete control from the part of the state of the employable workforce. So the fact that the, the state was actually controlling the price of labor, the mobility of labor, and uh, the supply of labor. So all of this makes it such that it becomes common knowledge amongst the workers that exploitation is no longer a natural fact, but it actually is a classist choice coming out of political institution, the government. So this immense 
breakdown of let's say fair capitalism and the importance of the state taking over the war economy means that there are a series of alternatives to capitalism that begin emerging very concretely. So chapter two, three, and four of the book, of the first, which is, constitutes the first part of the book, gets into the plurality of alternatives that were emerging um, in a spectrum of lesser to greater radicality. So chapter two gets into the reconstructionists, who were basically pre-Keynesians prior to Keynes and much more radical than Keynes in asserting the priority of political necessities over economic necessities. So a series of very um, sophisticated projects for the emancipation of the working classes from public housing, communal homes that would help also women have the time to actually dedicate to other um, activities adult education, the birth of the welfare state, all of this is in chapter two. And I look at the documents of the Ministry of Reconstruction in Britain that was really exceptional in its capacity to envision an, a nation that really put citizens first above profit. And the idea was that, of course, with the war, anything seemed possible, right? Something that we can relate to still now. With the war, the state all of a sudden didn't have to abide by the gold standard nor by the balanced budget rule that had been the standard in Britain uh, for the whole of its basically existence. All of a sudden the state could spend a lot of money for political objectives, namely winning the war. So at that point it became clear that it was also political choice to spend this money after the war for its citizens. So this is the reconstructionist model. But the idea of the book is that this reconstructionism that was emerging ultimately to pacify a population that was demanding more did nothing else but escalate further demand for social change. And this is why chapter three and four are dedicated to the agency of the workers themselves in Britain and Italy who directly were demanding self-governance of production. So again, here, there were a, a variety of alternative ways of envisaging, of envisaging self-governance of production. You went from the uh, process of the Sankey Committee in Great Britain, in which there was the idea that the state was going to nationalize coal, so the main industry. So this was kind of a pioneering project to a further nationalization. But this nationalization went hand in hand with uh, workers' self-management of industry. Then you had other projects that were much more radical from the building guilds, so guild socialism, uh, all the way to something that was more about also breaking from the, cap from the capitalist state. So the uh, experience of the British shop stewards, the revolutionary shop steward movement, and its counterpart in Italy, the factory councils, the Workers' Council movement that had its hub in Turin, Italy, with L'Ordine Nuovo of Antonio Gramsci and Palmiro Togliatti. So, of course, in the eyes of these radical workers, you had to abolish the capitalist state with the capitalist means of production. So this first part of the book that I'm very, I'm really not capable of transmitting in its complexity uh, of um, primary sources. So my effort here is really that of um, giving voice to the men and women at the time without the problem of, that many historians have of looking at the past with the eyes of the present. Right. So what happens, unfortunately, is uh, bourgeois historians in particular, but historians in general, Marxist historians as well, kind of relook at the years after the First World War, the revolutionary years in kind of defeatist terms with the idea, OK, anyway, you know, nothing really happened. The revolution was didn't occur in the West of Europe. We know what happened in, in Russia. So even someone like G.D.H. Cole, who was actually in the front line in 1919 with the 
guild socialist movement, in his big book about um, the Labour Party in Britain in 1958, is basically saying there is no way a revolution could actually have happened at the time. But if you look at what was happening then, if you actually look at what was people were writing in pamphlets, in, in newspapers, in the archives of the bureaucracy, what you see is a completely different spirit. A sense that the system was definitely going to end and that these alternatives were not abstract, they were very concrete and they were successful. So it's interesting, for example, the British guilds, um, they were looked upon with interest by mainstream economists who are saying, oh, of course, if you don't discipline the worker and if you eliminate the profit motive, no one will go back to, no one will actually show up to work, right? That was like kind of the, the um, expectation was that self-governance of workers in in the name of production for use and not for profit was going to completely fail because people had no incentives to actually work. And of course, what you see historically is the exact opposite, that the guilds were extremely um, successful exactly because people were much more motivated in participating in a democratic collective enterprise, right? So even the mainstream economists were surprised by the economic success, even by their own categories, right? They're very surprised by the outcome. So the chapter that is most interesting in this first part of the book is chapter four, because it's about how Lordi de Nuovo and the movement for ca factory councils was not just about putting into practice alternative modes of organization of production and distribution, it was also about rethinking the world we were in. So debunking the bourgeois institutions went hand in hand with debunking the bourgeois approach to knowledge. So kind of a methodological breakthrough in the way we think about the world and an economic theory that gave direct agency to the worker. So an economic theory that denaturalized capitalism, an economic theory that put at center stage the producer as uh, this agent that would take over once classes were abolished. And especially an economic theory that understood that there could not be any political democracy without economic democracy. So the importance of the connection between the economic and the political and the factory assembly as the first nucleus of a new state which was not alienated from the people, but was actually of the people. And this was actually happening concretely. In Italy, we had a full month of occupation of the factories in the 1920s that concerned the whole peninsula. And it was a moment in which the idea that the council movement in the factory was uniting with the occupation of the land and the self-governance of agricultural production for the peasants in Italy. So this first part of the book, I think, gives us uh, good tools to still use today to confront our current uh, crisis of the system. Uh, but it was clearly a moment in which the existential crisis was so strong that it was not going to leave the ruling class elite to just watch and observe the fall of their, of their rule. This is why uh, chapter two, uh, sorry, chapter two, part two of the book is devoted to austerity as the reaction as the mechanism of the of reaction, as this political project to preserve capital as a social relation of production, so to reassert wage relations and private property of the means of production. How does this book, uh, how does this second part of the capital order work? Well, it works by starting us off with an international perspective the two first international financial conferences that happened in Brussels in 1920 and in Genoa in 1922, in which for the first time economic experts, so economic professors, were called upon by the various governments, European governments, to advise for the best possible policy in order to resolve the crisis 
of the system. And again, it was a moment in which inflation was high. So reminiscence with the presence is always very clear. Inflationism was not just an economic problem, as this is clear to economists still today. It was mostly a political problem, right? Because it was triggering the breakdown of the entire system as such. And this is something that Keynes himself realized very well. And Keynes, in fact, was the first proponent of austerity for a great part of the 1920s until the working classes in Britain were defeated. So using his words, I seem to be very bad at finding the citations today. I'm sorry because I had the here it is a continuance of inflationism and high prices will not only depress the exchanges but by their effect on prices will strike at the whole basis of contract of security and of the capitalist system generally this is Keynes in 1920 so clearly the fear that uh, inflation was also a factor that was contributing to the breakdown of the dominant ideology and the necessity to protect the status quo. So here it is where um, at Genoa and at Brussels, this novel financial code of austerity was put together. And it is fascinating to note how the type of rhetoric the rhetoric of we are all sacrificing together for a better future, right? The idea we're all in the same boat. Um, citizens have lived beyond their means. Citizens are not able to understand the economic truth and need to be educated in the limits of what is possible. Fundamentally, the line, there is no alternative, which sounds so familiar today, was uh, drafted at these conferences. And I, I use again the words of the people in that moment, of these experts in that moment, to show how austerity emerges as a project of global technocracy. So the uniting of certain economic theories with certain economic policies to coerce the population into accepting capitalism as the only possible solution to how to organize society. These conferences set the tone and then the book gets into the specificities of these two countries that I've, I've already been studying in the first part of the book, which are Britain and Italy. And it is here that the protagonist of my story speak to us and the protagonists of my story are the economic experts who are running the major state institutions that were implementing austerity after the First World War. Now, these experts were professors, academics. In Italy, for example, it was the exponents of the new framework, the new paradigm of pure economics. They call themselves pure economists, and they founded the framework that is still dominant today, the neoclassical framework, which was based on the marginalist turn. And the experts I look at were economists who realized that du the Duce, Benito Mussolini, who came to power in 1922 in Italy, was the best man at the right moment to implement austerity. So these economists found themselves for the first time capable of implementing their economic models directly upon a population that until that moment had been very turbulent and asked for its change. And instead they imposed hardcore austerity. So I think this is the moment in which we can understand austerity as fundamentally made up of the motto, consume less, produce more. Consume less, produce more is again a motto I did not invent, but it was actually a coined at the Brussels and Genoa conference. And the idea is that austerity was a twofold project that involved consensus building. And this is where the, the role of economic theory is very important. 
and coercion. The importance of the material results of austerity policies. So I would like to just devote a little bit of time to these two elements to explain one of the most provocative theses of this work. And one of the most provocative theses of this work is that what was going on in the cradle of parliamentary democracy, of liberalism, Great Britain, right? The empire which supposedly represented the most advanced form of parliamentary democracy and liberal ideology. And what was going on in the newborn fascist regime, right? So these supposed opposite worlds, we, if we, in our imaginary, there's nothing more opposite to one another than fascist, fascism and liberalism, right? Or at least this is the mainstream narrative is that these are polar, polar opposites. But once you focus on austerity, what you realize is that what was going on in these two countries was strikingly similar. In both countries, experts used their political power and the state's machinery in order to coerce people into wage relations that were also lower wages which allowed for the profit rates to start soaring once more and especially allowed for the foreclosures of any alternatives to the capitalist society. So this is basically the theme, and now maybe I can get into a little bit how this happened. Well, in Britain, it is clear that coercion happened in the form that we are seeing right now today. How do you cool down the labor market? We are in a historical moment in which the workers are having the upper hand because we know that there's shortage of labor supply, even today, right? So in a moment in which there's a shortage of labor supply, in which unions are striking everywhere still today, what is happening? Well, economists today, someone like Larry Summers, are imposing interest rate hikes, which have as a result that of cooling down the economy, which means fundamentally increasing the unemployment rate and thus strengthening the discipline and secure the ending of any demand for social change. So this is exactly what happened in Britain in 1920. In a moment of explosive social uprisings, in 1920, the Bank of England increased the interest rates by 7%. And this immediately had as an effect the rise of unemployment rate to 17% of the insured workforce, which basically meant that strikes tumbled and ended. And with the strikes ending, with unemployment rising, the wage share started going down. Okay, wage share is the amount of GDP that goes to work, the, to, to wages rather than to profits. And what you see is a complete turnaround of what was going on just a couple of years prior. In 1918, 1919, we see a massive surge in the wage share. And just in a couple of years, this self-induced recession had the great benefit of turning around the power relations and of restabilizing the class basis of our society. So in this sense, the words of GDH Cole are quite illuminating. He said, he was observing in 1922, and he says, the big working class offensive had been successfully stalled off, and British capitalism, though threatened with economic adversity, felt itself once more safely in the saddle and well able to cope, both industrially and politically, with any attempt that might still be made from the labor side to unseat it. So here, really, Cole is pointing its finger at the real true success of austerity, defeating the working class alternatives. So in Britain, 
It was the power of tweaking the dials of macroeconomic management that made the difference. Interest rate hikes with cuts in social spending, right? So monetary austerity together with fiscal austerity. And when I talk about fiscal austerity, what I mean is not just cuts in general. It's cuts in the social sector which allow transferring resources from the majority to the minority. With monetary austerity and fiscal austerity, which, I mean, I give, I talk about at length what this meant in terms of also regressive taxation. So fiscal austerity being both about cuts in the social budget. So for example, the fact that the welfare state, which was born right after the war in order again to appease the population in 1920, it was completely, uh, all the resources were eliminated in just a couple of years. Land fit for heroes and social housing eliminated and so on and so forth. With monetary austerity in the form of interest rate hikes, fiscal austerity in the form of slashes of the social budget and regressive taxation. So, right, fiscal austerity is both about where you cut, so how you spend and where you spend. And it's about spending away from the people to pay back the debt. And guess what? When you pay back the debt, what's happening is that you are, in fact, putting the money that before was going to social services and so as rights, education, health care of the working classes in the hands of the saving investing minority, right? This is exactly what's still today when you say you pay back the debt, where the debt goes and now more than ever, the creditors are also usually foreign creditors. So monetary austerity, fiscal austerity, and industrial austerity. A fundamental element to understand austerity still today is what is happening immediately in terms of labor relation. So privatization as a core policy of austerity. Massive privatization to depoliticize the economic to remove the state from being the main employer, which immediately politicized labor relations because you were facing the state as a worker right? Public employees are immediately, strikes of the public employees are immediately political. Instead, by privatizing, what you're doing is you're throwing the people again to forcing them to confront the impersonal laws of the market, right? So you increase the competition of workers in the private sector. And we know, as economists still tell us today, this will decrease the reservation wage, meaning that people will be willing to accept lower wages. And especially there will be no alternative but to be market dependent and thus to accept to go to work in return for a wage. So this is the coercion, the trinity, the austerity trinity, what I describe as an austerity trinity, the combination of fiscal, monetary, industrial austerity that work in unison and mutually reinforce one another with the goal of structurally transferring resources from the majority of citizens to the minority. So this was happening in Britain, but was happening also in Italy, of course. And in Italy, it was happening in an even more directly coercive form because of the fascist state being able directly through law to ban unions, make strike illegal, and also to cut wages, repress wages by ro royal decrees, okay? So again, the same ultimate objective, but in the Italian case, more about political coercion rather than the impersonal laws of the market, which were the most strongly coercive element in the British case, right? So in Britain, they played a lot with the economic downturn that tied the hands of labor, so the impersonal laws taking over. While in Italy, it was more directly the fascist state run by mainstream neoclassical economists that produced the same result of quashing labor demands and of bringing down the costs of labor. 
So this is coercion. The austerity trinity in action in both states and the similarities of results is what I analyze both qualitatively through archival work and quantitatively with graphs that show you the change of power relations that was very quick in just a couple of years. This went hand in hand with the consensus bit, right? So while people were forced into accepting uh, their condition as wage workers, economists were also trying to convince people that they were acting in the name of the good of the whole and that their economic policy was indeed neutral and above parts. So this is a big theme in the book, is the uh, crucial political role played by supposedly apolitical economic theory, right? So apolitical economic theory that presented itself as completely unbiased had the very important reserve the result of completely killing the agency of the workers in the models themselves. So we go from an economy framework that is based on classes, conflict between classes, and value coming out of exploited labor, so the centrality of the worker in allowing for capital accumulation to happen. So this is the classical Marxian framework that was diffused at the time to a new economic paradigm, which is not about classes, it's about individuals, it's not about conflict, it's about harmony. And it's about shifting agency from the worker that now is completely understood only as a passive cog to the machine to the virtuous saver investor. So this in very important shift, the new engine of the economic machine is those who can, those who can endure abstinence, right? So the importance of you kick away the labor theory of value and you put at the center stage abstinence as the source of value, the capacity of some to save and thus invest. And this being how everyone else benefits, right? So typical trickle down economics, but the original, uh, the original trickle down economics that came about at the end of the, uh, of the 1900s, but was really diffused, sorry, of, 19, of the 1800s, but was really diffused at the beginning of the 20th century century. So the years we're looking at are the years in which the new paradigm of, of pure economics that completely kills the centrality of the workers and actually gives the sense that if you're poor, you deserve it, something that we have all internalized today, right? That if we are poor, it's only because we didn't work hard enough. We were not capable of becoming saver investors, right? This apparently very emancipatory idea by which anyone, if they try hard enough, can participate and become part of those successful saver investors. And these saver investors do nothing else but by their own self-interest do the good of the whole. Now, this apparently emancipatory insight is actually one of the most classist of all, because, of course, it presupposes that there is no coercion and no trapping in our social class. But if the workers don't make it, it's all their fault. Okay, so fundamentally, I look at these protagonists, these first thinkers, the first exponents of this neoclassical framework that were using Mussolini's fascist state and were using the power of the Bank of England in Britain in order to impose this new worldview that was fundamentally justifying austerity policies. Why? Well, because austerity is all about shifting resources from the majority to the minority. And these economists were saying, well, that's exactly the most efficient economic policy because we need to incentivize the savers investors. And this is why, an example, regressive taxation, right, which is part and parcel of fiscal austerity. So the fact that what does regressive taxation mean? Regressive taxation means that in relative terms, people who have less 
are paying more taxes. So in those years, in the early 1920s, it was the moment in which workers started to get to the workers started to get taxed. For the first time, the state enlarged the pool of taxpayers. The state curtail any, any capital levy and any taxes on profits and instead increase direct taxes on workers and also indirect taxes through consumption taxes, right? Consumption taxes that we know that are very high also in the United States are the best form of regressive taxation. Why? Well, because for me, the cost of buying bread and for Bezos, the cost of buying bread is the same, right? Is the tax that hits everyone the same, meaning that it hits those who have less the most. So again, something that was produced in the early 1920s, but is of course a feature of American society clearly very sharply today, If we think about the fact that while wages in the U.S. have been stagnant for decades, now for the first time in history, the country's richest 400 families pay a lower overall tax rate than any other income group. Okay, This is the United States today. And again, the origins of this regressive taxation comes in the 1920s and was justified by the neoclassical framework. So I think I already spoke a lot. Um, I just wanted to give a sense that the second part of the book really gets into the, the nitty gritty of how this austerity logic plays out. And, and a last important theme that emerges is how Mussolini's regime was actually strengthened thanks to the um, application of austerity because all of the international liberal elites was applauding Mussolini. So I have a very important chapter, chapter eight, which reconstructs the general worldview of technocrats. Uh, sorry, general worldview. What these technocrats thought about Mussolini. And I look at the foreign uh, office archives. I went to the Bank of England and did a lot of research there. And what emerges is a clear picture of celebration of Mussolini's capacity to tame the Italian population through austerity. So this is just one of the various quotes I could end with, which is this letter that Montagu Norman, the head of the Bank of England uh, throughout the 20s, in 1926, he writes this letter to J.P. Morgan, uh, Jack Morgan of J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase as a bank was uh, very crucial for Mussolini's success from the very beginning, they financially supported Mussolini. And this is what Montagu Norman, the supposed liberal, unbiased expert, was saying. Fascism has surely brought order out of chaos over the last few years. Something of the kind was no doubt needed if the pendulum was not to swing too far in quite the other direction. The Duce was the right man at a critical moment. So like him, this, again, chapter 8 is full of the reconstruction of the fact that Italy ultimately was a dependent country. It was extremely dependent on international creditors. And austerity was, yes, a national uh, project because of these experts wanting to tame the internal class conflict, which was represented by the factory council movement, especially, and the will to take, to to overcome wage relations, but also out of a necessity that was imposed from abroad. So the last chapter of this book tries to rethink all these themes that emerged out of this historical case study to show how they constantly play out throughout the 20th and 21st century, right? So this theme of authoritarian liberalism, the theme of the importance of insulating economic decision-making from the people, right? The de-democratization process of economic decision-making, the fact that we are now used to thinking about economic decisions as something that don't pertain us. We are not experts. We don't understand what goes on. Let's leave it to the Fed. Let's leave it to those who know and act for the good of the whole. Well, all of these themes, right, about the fundamental repressive 
project of austerity in foreclosing alternatives and in increasing market dependence, this is something that we can see until the present moment. So again, the idea of this book is to look at historical episode, a very interesting one in which capitalism was really facing its most devastating existential crisis to show how austerity was very successful then and is still successful now in preserving capitalism as the only game in town. So like, austerity not as a theoretical error, not as just bad economic theory that brings about bad policy, but austerity as a very intelligent project. And it's only by really understanding how austerity is core to the function of capitalism that we can then act in order to really defeat it and to imagine an alternative future. This is why I'll read just the ending note of the book. The book ends in a very um, optimistic tone by saying, Austerity is a political project arising out of the need to preserve capitalist class relations of domination. It is the outcome of collective action to foreclose any alternatives to capitalism. It can thus be subverted through collective counteraction. The study of its logic and purpose is a first step in, the, in this direction. Thank you. I okay. To, as always. Mara, Sorry. thank you very much. Uh, it sounds like a fascinating book, and I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, I'm sure everyone else is too. Uh, so we're, we can move to questions and comments. Uh, if you do have one, uh, please either type the word stack into the chat and we'll add you to the speaker stack or just use the reaction button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to uh, raise your hand in the room. Uh, I'll start off with a, if a question, if I may. Uh, one of our reading groups uh, here has been uh, reading The Future is Degrowth. Uh, which is a book that, that challenges and deconstructs the ideological fetish of economic growth, quote unquote. Um, so I wonder if you could reflect on the ways that growth uh, has always seemed to go hand in hand with austerity, strangely enough, perhaps, uh, as, as a paradigm for the defense of capital, so, such that advocates of austerity justify it on the grounds that it will enable and facilitate growth. Right. And it seems to me that calling growth into question and advocating notions such as sufficiency, the good life, public luxury, production for use, and so on, would also go a long way to calling austerity into question. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So this is really important. Um, the exact point here is that austerity is not detrimental to growth. It's actually preconditioned to growth, right? So because in order for have any to have any growth, within a capitalist economic system, you need wage relations to be secured. You need people to, accepting to go work for a wage. And this is why, to bring it back to the present, why economic experts are so worried right now is that with the great resignation combined with, the, so the fact that the labor market is tight, the labor market being tight and people not only the labor market being tied means not only that the cost of labor is going up, and this is a problem for the profit expectation, which is what you need in order for private capital to invest and thus for economic growth to happen. You also have the problem of people not wanting to go work at all anymore, right? So the anti-work uh, movement. Uh, so the strikes for higher wages, and it's great to look at the Cornell Labor Action Tracker if you haven't checked it out yet, which shows you it's a labor action tracker online and you can actually look at the in at in real time the amount of strikes that are happening and present in the united states and there's more than 800 going on at the moment and they're pretty big okay so tight labor market not only means that there's um that there's more strikes going on and workers of course have the higher uh, have have a greater bargain power it also means that there's there's Literally millions of Americans who quit their job just in August, 4.3 million Americans stopped going to work because they just didn't believe in that type of life anymore. Right. So this is the point. So, yes, austerity is fundamental to growth. 
even if the Keynesians tell us, oh, the province of austerity is that it bring, doesn't bring us growth. No, it does in the sense that it, 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 we need that aspect. So the idea here is exactly to say, if you can't have capitalism without austerity, this means that the only way to get out of austerity is, of course, to get out of the very precon preconditions and the very objective of capitalism, which is fundamentally economic growth, right? So this is why it's interesting because, of course, the ecological dimension was not something that was clear to the, um, to the protagonist of my story. In 1918, 1919, Gramsci, Togliatti, the shop stewards, the guild socialists, all of these actors that were actually really, really um, lucid in uh, um, building concretely a post-capitalist future did not really have the ecological dimension in mind so much. Uh, but it's clear that what they were doing then is clearly what we need to rethink, of course, not just reenact it, it's impossible, but like, use their insight in order to really um, start thinking about ways of organizing production that could, uh, in fact, um, be compatible with, a social enrichment that is not the growth of GDP, right? You can have social enrichment and wealth, welfare and general improvement of material conditions without being stuck in the idea that in order to get there, we need to get, be mediated by the profit motive, which of course is devastating, especially right now for the, the planet as a whole. So definitely, it's, it's, it, I think this is why this critique of austerity can be used to really emancipate ourselves with a lot of preconceptions that is very, I think, dangerous, especially for people in the generation of, you know, people born in the 60s and 70s. It seems to me that there is a lot of sense by which we can just go back to that virtuous moment of capitalism after the Second World War uh, in which everything was working. Uh, the book is trying to show that, no, that actually, um, this is actually going to be my next project, is to actually show how actually, even after the Second World War, austerity was crucial to capitalism, which means that um, economic growth not only is ecologically disastrous, but it's also fundamentally exploitative, even in its most, most inclusive form of what happened after the Second World War. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's go to uh, Jim Cregan, and uh, then we'll take uh, Mary and Ron. Yeah, thank you for a very uh, <clears throat> thought-provoking talk. And um, I'm especially interested uh, in your next project, uh, but, but um, I'm interested here in eliciting any thoughts you might have um, on, um, uh, on the dimensions of uh, this project, because uh, when we think of um, neoliberalism, uh, we think of the uh, we think um, not of um, anything that happened after World War One, uh, but, but uh, the austerity policies that brought an end uh, to the so-called um, thirty glorious years after World War Two, and um, at, at when there was supposedly a social contract. Uh, I don't like the term, but, uh, but it's commonly used between uh, capital and labor, and the welfare state was strong, and unions were strong uh, in the Western countries. Now, um, the, uh, the story of that is, um, very di is different in a lot of crucial respects, I think, uh, from the story you tell of what happened after World War I, uh, because, uh, first of all, uh, there was no challenge to capitalism, at least not for the working class and not to the extent uh, that there was in the wake of World War I and the Russian Revolution. Um, uh, there was the rise of the Eastern Bloc and the Cold War and competition with them, uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, but but, um, uh, but, but uh, yeah. one thing I think that has to be explained uh, is why these welfare state policies uh, were continued um, why uh, the class struggle uh, was to a large extent softened, at least in key sectors, and um, why the standard of living rose steadily. So the origins. And the second thing uh, that has to be explained is uh, what brought it to an end. And, um, you know, here I, have, I think you have to talk about such things as um, growing um, 
into capitalist competition, uh, which had serious effects, um, uh, which uh, uh, led to a serious fall in the rate of profit. And um, also, uh, the, uh, in, in, in that context, uh, the power of unions, uh, which uh, at least um, in the United States and, uh, and in Britain, uh, thought could no longer be tolerated. Um, so um, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in your thoughts uh, on both the origins and the end of what, uh, of, uh, what we normally consider uh, to be a humane and non-austerity capitalism those years. Thank you. Um, yeah, so these are all uh, very important points, and this is going to be um, exactly so, some of the reflection that I'm going to try to make uh, further in the new book project. What I can uh, say uh, now that emerges out of this book is um, is are a couple of points. Um, I had one that was uh, important now is uh, escaping me. One second. Well, uh, so first of all, I think one important uh, element that we need to consider is um, that I'm trying to make the claim that the watershed moment in actually shaping how um, capitalism functions today was actually much prior to the neoliberal term. And it's actually dated back to the early 20th century, right? So, and I think this is important because it also can set the tone for what Keynesianism was. And of course, Keynes and Keynesianism are uh, two very different uh, animals, right? Um, and certainly uh, what we see is that Keynes um, could become favorable to social redistribution in order to boost economic growth, going back to the other point, um, in a moment in which the working class offensive had already been defeated. So if you see the Keynes of the early 1920s, and this is a Keynes that is not very often explored. Actually, it's interesting because the biographer of Keynes, uh, Robert Skidelsky, who actually wrote one of the blurbs of the book, and he's, uh, we're in conversation, he himself, knowing Keynes well, knows that this aspect of Keynes has been quite kept secret, but Keynes in the early 1920s, and this is the Keynes of my book, is the most austere of all, because he is the first one who's very worried about the break of the bourgeois social contract, right? As you said, um, when he starts uh, becoming about uh, criticizing austerity only really after the 1926 general strike in Britain, which was actually the death knell of the working class offensive. So kind of, I think what you can get from my book is it's in the ashes of austerity that all of the humane capitalism of the glorious years after the Second World War becomes possible, right? So Keynes himself starts writing the general theory in a moment in which the working class is already defeated. And as you said, after the Second World War, there was no fundamental questioning of the pillar of wage relations, right? It, the, the union had accepted that as the foundation of then supposedly an order that could benefit also the workers with the proviso that they were willing to accept exploitation fundamentally. Based on, of course, greater productivity of labor, so um, a form of exploitation that is much better than in terms of uh, workers' uh, living conditions than the exploitation that is based on repressing wages, which is clearly what is happening more now in the service sector. Yet the idea that th the intuition here is that welfare, welfare capitalism presupposes austerity capitalism, both it, chronologically, uh, because it required the defeat of the working class that happened after the First World War, but also structurally, because of the fact that also, and this is going to be really where I'm going to focus my study uh, in the next book, is to see that Keynesianism was quite austere after the Second World War, even if we like have an idealized reading of it. Uh, I think there is a lot of de-idealization to do, because if you look at the experts in power in the United States, for example, they use Keynesian idea of, um, 
of um, of uh, counter cyclical measures fundamentally to fight back against inflation. So the fear of inflation is a structural limit that made it such that also Keynesians in moments of economic growth had to adopt quite austere policies in order to avoid the destabilization of money. So uh, I don't know if I can answer uh, your question right now. I mean, there's so many books on this that I don't think I'm the right one here to answer the question of um, what allowed this moment to be ex exceptional. But certainly what I want to point out is that my book helps understand that it was clearly exceptional. Um, it was exceptional to a longer history of structural austerity. And even this exception, which presupposes austerity, was quite austere if we go look at what it really meant for the workers, even in the glorious years. Um, so I think also looking at what Keynes himself was thinking uh, in the 1920s and also what his models are about, this is something I get to in the afterwards, there are some fundamental commonalities between austerity and Keynesianism. For example, in the role the state has to play, right? The idea that the state is a neutral actor that should be led by the expert. Keynes is a very big um, supporter of central bank independence. Central bank independence is one of the pillars of austerity, right? Because only independent central banks can actually act in a way that is favorable uh, to defeat inflation, okay? So this idea of independence as fundamental meaning, meaning not liable to democratic decision-making, so kind of encasing decision-making to the, to the expert away from the general public, this is something that Keynes never let go of, okay? So the importance of the expert being in charge of economic decisions is something that is clearly extremely anti-democratic anti and it's something that the Keynesian, Keynes himself and the Keynesians of the golden age kept very strong as a belief. Marion, you want to make your comment or question? Sure. Um, forgive me for asking you to apply your scholarly work to the current situation, but um, there seems certainly to be a, a rise in fascism, fascist dictators around the world and fascist ideology, even in groups here in this country. And I'm wondering what recent practice of, practices of austerity you see as having to do with this new fascism. Oh, on the, on the, on the, yes, thank you. This is very interesting. It's actually um, quite something that can... Um, be misleading in the title of the book, The Capital Order, How Economists Invent Austerity and Pave the Way to Fascism. Mm -hmm. So this paving the way to fascism mm -hmm. is something that I had to like dispute a little bit with uh, with my editor. Yes. Because the, the reconstruction in the book is about how austerity fortifies fascism. Mm -hmm. Fascism implements austerity. So... Italian fascism, so the actual fascism historically, was not about social policy at all. That was a lot of propaganda. Fascism was actually about repressing wages mm -hmm. and was about austerity. And austerity allowed it to be successful as a regime that lasted 20 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So again, the gaining of legitimacy of fascism because of its alliance with liberalism in the 1920s as being fundamental to the strength of Mussolini's regime. So this is the idea here. Now, what I think is the following, that clearly fascism in many other situations, again, we don't want to use the word too extensively, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, historical fascism in Mussolini's, in, in the case of Mussolini, but other forms of fascism, like the case of Pinochet in Chile, mm -hmm. used austerity as a fundamental tool to... Um, get gain acceptance international legitimacy and thus maintain order mm -hmm. and, and control now i think fascism today a lot of supposed populist fascism again terms that are very broad that need qualification but just to use words that are often used also not very appropriately mm -hmm. um what you see is that similar to what happened in Nazi Germany. I would say it's more similar to that case, which is a case in which austerity had been implemented in Germany 
very strictly with horrible consequences for the people in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And Hitler did not come to power like Mussolini with an austerity agenda. Mussolini was came to power with the idea we are going to implement, uh, inflict law and order in an austerity form. Uh, Hitler came to power with the exact opposite understanding that we were going to make it a change and actually give to the people what the people d- desired and deserved, which is actually some resources, so social expenditures, right? Mm-hmm. So I think the type of uh, what we can see resurging today historically is more uh, a type of fascism that wins electorally. Okay, so it, it, the appeal, the electoral appeal, the reason why they actually come to power is because they are promising an alternative to austerity. Mm-hmm. So they come to power as the alternative. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is also clear uh, with Giorgia Meloni right here in Italy. I'm in Italy at present. And Giorgia Meloni came to power with a very ambitious program of fundamental social expenditures, especially for numerous families, for the workers. Now, the minute she came to office, the continuity with the previous regimes became obvious. So he, she kept the same Ministry of Econo- Minister of Economics of the Draghi government. He was the Minister of Development under Draghi, Giorgetti. He's a Bocconi boy, one of the founders of the neoclassical framework that I described here. I mean, the founders I described here in the neoclassical framework are then like the Bocconi University is kind of the hub right now. So fundamentally, Meloni came to power some certain promises, but she already broke them. Because again, and it's not just that it's her choice that comes out of nowhere is the fact that we are constrained. Italy is a country that has serious constraints if Italy wants to participate to global capitalist order. It cannot afford speculation on its debt, right? So what happens is that you need to um, secure market confidence, right? The confidence of the markets. So what do you do? Well, you continue with austerity even if you are elected with an opposite agenda. Now, the thing is that what really is fascist to me is what's happening in Italy today because you you use a strong state to implement austerity, even if you are elected with different promises. So long story short, I think that the case of fascist Italy is actually much similar to what actually happens when these fascist governments come into power. But the reason why they emerge is actually because people are fed up with austerity and see them as the only alternative. And then, of course, they immediately, in order to maintain the confidence of the international markets, they immediately break their promises and revert back to the usual austerity. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay, who else? David, we have. Good, David, go ahead. You're muted. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, David Worley here. I'm, I'm very interested in, um, yeah, in the point uh, that you made about how um, uh, the difference between those who kind of openly. Uh, espouse austerity as so-called as the way as a as a necessity for keeping the system going, and those who say, "Well, it's a it's a mistake. It's a it's a theoretical mistake." I, I noticed there was an article. I don't know if you saw it in the guard published in the Guardian by Joseph Stiglitz uh, the other day, in which he said exactly that point. He was criticizing the Federal Reserve for continuing to raise interest rates. He said, "Well." It's only it's only going to cause more pain, and it's going to cause more pain to the people can, that can least afford it. And um, and he offers some alternatives um, of uh, controlling inflation. And I just wondered if you. I don't know if you saw the article or not, but I wondered whether um, uh, 
that's sort of an, is that an example of what you mean by by people say well uh, us uh, of, uh, of you're breaking a little is he breaking just for me or for everyone you're breaking a little so i got i got i got the main uh, gist of what you're saying so the point is that that article is being expressive of oh, it's, it's yeah, maybe it's for everyone some yeah, I think it's for everyone, but I understand. It's for everyone, yeah, I'm getting it too. But I, I understand. David, can you hear us though? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so I can hear. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. It's my microphone. So I have, I so I have not read the article uh, explicitly, so I will, I'm very happy to do that. I wanted to just, before I answer your question, say that I actually wrote myself two articles on The Guardian that tries to actually say that it's absurd to say that austerity is just a stupid idea. Uh, because uh, the reason why this recession is happening is clearly because of its impact on labor relations. And this is the very purpose that these economists are very explicit about, right? So this is what's interesting. Larry Summers tells us in order for our economic growth to be smooth again, the labor market has to be less tight, which means that we need to have a 7% unemployment rate. He literally says in order for our system to work, People need to be suffering unemployment. Otherwise, the system doesn't work. So it's very explicit about the fact that economic violence is the structural foundation of capitalist economic growth. So I think that's very important. Okay. Uh, so anyway, uh, um, maybe you can take a look at these two articles that uh, that uh, that um, I wrote on the Guardian a while back that uh, tried to repoliticize the issue. Now I did not read Stieglitz, but what I can tell you is that he is clearly uh, usually an exponent of the idea that we can discuss austerity in fundamentally apolitical terms, in technical terms. And if only we can have, you know, a better toolbox available, then that's fine. Now, the problem here is that what you see is that all Keynesians, from new Keynesians to post-Keynesians, when, when there is inflation and when there is this heating up of the economy, they have no other option but to revert to austerity as well. Because the real other option would be to do serious price controls, which would ultimately require forms of planning, which are by definition already something that would go beyond standard capitalist management, right? So I don't know what he is proposing, but what I can tell you is that if the only way to deflate by using the market mechanism is to cool down the economy by increasing interest rates, which will in fact um, slow down the economy and get people unemployed and thus prices will go down. So this analysis of the austerity people is not wrong. It just explicitly tells you though that it's a class warfare. It's unilateral class warfare. Austerity is unilateral class warfare. So it's it's if it, it, it makes a lot of sense. It's not wrong. It's very right if you want to preserve a classist system. Mary Dugan, you're next. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um well, I, I confess I'm not apprised of the current uh, or last couple of years of uh, what's been going on with Greece. But of course, uh, I read I read the book and and um, and was completely impressed by how much the EU um, beat up on on that country. And so, are they now in uh, in worse in worse shape than Italy, as as they as they were said to be before. Um, just uh, any words from you would be quite nice. Thanks. Before, uh, just to uh, clarify, before they started implementing austerity in two thousand eight, or before, uh, when when is the before? Oh yeah, I mean uh, it's it's and that's where um, someone like Stieglitz is also right in pointing out that oftentimes austerity does not get the supposed goals of balancing the budget and uh, reboosting growth, right? This is a clear example of countries like Italy and Britain did way worse with, with austerity. Um, the, the debt didn't, it's true, there was no growth and the debt actually increased because of this and um, uh, unemployment 
So the idea of the uh, ex uh, supporters of austerity is that if you do supply side reforms, if you um, deregulate the labor market, this will ultimately allow more people to get hired, right? The idea is that the reason why people are not getting hired is because wages are too sticky. There's too many, like, there's too much intrusion of unions in the market processes. You just flexibilize labor, everyone will be employed and it, at like lower cost, but they will be employed. And this is clearly not the case because Greece as Italy, the youth unemployment rate is exorbitant, okay? So clearly here we see the example of the real success of austerity, which is fundamentally that of at the co cost of huge social suffering, you have defeated alternatives to capitalism because austerity did defeat yeah. All the ideas of breaking away from the European Union, all of the supposed alternatives, they caved, right? Mm -hmm. So the real, uh, the real success is that you defeated alternatives uh, at the cost of social well-being of the population. And Stiglitz is right in saying this hasn't produced economic growth. But what my argument, which is the Marxian critique to austerity, is to say, hey, listen, Stiglitz, if you want capitalism, then you got to take austerity with it. Because as soon as you think you can have capitalism with austerity, well, guess what? People will start saying, hey, tough luck. We're not coming back to work for such low wages. People will start imagining alternatives. And the system will not have its foundation of wage relation in place. And this is a why, exactly why ultimately Stieglitz can um, argue with Summers all he wants. But he fundamentally agrees with the fact that if workers you know, start thinking they can do too much. Well, you got to find a way to make them think that the only way out is capitalism and no best way to do that than austerity. Uh, thank you. Okay, I think uh, David wanted to ask a follow-up question and then it looks like Jim may have one as well if no one else uh, wants to speak first. Go ahead, David. Um, I'm good. I, I, I think that Professor, yes, responded. Her last remarks were... But I, yeah, I yeah. So, uh, it, yeah, I think it's a facade. It's, it's again, it's an, that's why I wrote this book. The opposition between Austerians and anti Austerians of the Keynesian type, I think, is like more of a facade um, opposition uh, because ultimately they agree on the capital order. That's the title of the book, right? The capital order. They fundamentally agree on the capital order. Uh, then they might have small, small, you know, um, when is the right moment to do austerity, right? Uh, but Keynes himself said the boom, not the bust is the best moment for austerity. And this he said until the 40s, he's kept saying, I would have done exactly the same if I had gone back in the 1920s with my evolved theory of the 1930s. I would have had no other option in the early 20s but to go for austerity. Um but anyway, I'll read that article of um, of Stieglitz. So in case you want to email me, we can correspond. So I have actually read it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jim, go ahead. Yeah, I um, just have a question. And not only um, for the speaker, if she knows the answer, but uh, for anybody else here who might know the answer. Uh, but because um, my memory is a little fuzzy about the 70s, but as I recall, at one point, I think it was after the U.S. went off the gold standards, and Nixon, uh, who was president then, imposed mandatory wage and price controls. Yeah. Um, and um, as I recall, and I'm not sure about this, I wonder if anybody remembers, uh, but um, as I recall, he didn't uh, require any act of Congress to do this. Uh, he did this on his own executive authority. Um, so my question is, uh, would it be possible uh, in the face of inflation, uh, mounting inflation uh, in the United States and in other countries, if this applies, uh, based on executive authority to impose simply price controls without wage controls? Hmm. That's uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's all really interesting, and it's interesting because actually um, I, I I need to study this period more, so I I want to get into this much more. But what's clear, which is fascinating to me, is that once the gold standard broke off, that was the moment in which, in fact, you could try to do 
you know, you could try to, in fact, imagine price control without wage controls. But that's the moment in which they still decide not to do it, because I think of the political consequences of breaching the limits of what was politically feasible under capitalism. Um, so I think in general, um, it, 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 you, 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 um, if you do price controls without wage controls within capitalism, you risk having the serious problem of uh, supposedly the wage uh, push that will cause inflation, right? So that, that's the thing with, with Keynesians is that the, you, Keynesians, Keynesians themselves really need to wait, watch out for uh, monetary stability. And this is why if you're going to control prices, which means that potentially you're going to boost the purchasing power of the majority, you will need to also control wages because otherwise you risk uh, a seriously inflationary spiral. Sorry, I have my baby here. I need to feed him. But so I think we have we're almost done. One more question. He's Galileo. Hello. <laughs> Who's been uh, wanting some food for a while now. <laughs> we keep them good. <laughs> okay, we won't keep you much longer. If, uh, no, Jack, so anyway, would... I think, yeah, so just to say that's a really important point, And I think it goes to, to the fact that um, Nixon had no way out but to do austerity at that point. Uh, but I think um, if he wanted to not, you know, breach the limits of what capitalism means. Uh, but I think that's really an, an episode that we, we, I need to study more. And I'd be happy to discuss it further. Okay, uh, Jacqueline, if you'd like to ask the final question. and uh... Uh, Thank you, but I would prefer to let a mother take care of her duties since I know how important <laughs> that is. My question can be uh, held another time. I very much enjoyed this book, and congratulations on your book and on your beautiful baby. Thank you so much. And I hope I didn't publicize too much the second book that is not written with respect to the first. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll definitely, we'll definitely invite you back uh, for the second book. Yeah, and, uh, but, maybe, and, but maybe I sooner. do. Probably but sooner. Thank you so much. But I do really want to point out that the theoretical foundation for the the further historical expo exploration is in this one, because it actually, I think, it's by studying austerity in this different logic uh, through a Marxian critique that we can understand. There we are. That we can understand also uh, future moments historically, right? Uh, thank you. This has been great. And um, I hope we stay in touch. And I hope you get a chance to read the book. Thank you. Okay. Thanks again, uh, thank you. everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Thank we'll see you at uh, www.marksedproject.org for future events and classes.